What's going on, folks? Your boy again, Dr. Sean Thomas, back in the building. Be more today's show, episode 93. We are back, we are back, we are back in the building. And folks, 93 episodes. We're here in the month of April. Again, April showers bring May flowers. So we're getting through this month, but we are continuing to move forward positively through the month of April uh, with Be More Today's show. Uh, as you guys know, the show is blooming everywhere. No pun intended. 56 countries, 18,000 downloads. And I appreciate your love and support every single week. It does not go unnoticed. I love you guys. So if you are a follower of Be More Today, as always, please like and subscribe us on our platform, BeMoreToday.com. Uh, we have our swag store. We have my book. We have our, our swag gear, the podcast, clearly. And of course, we're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, continuing to put great content out there. Ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And just showing you guys how you can be great every single day. Date. Our quote for today is simple as always. We don't stop playing games because we get old. We get old because we stop playing. And folks, you know, I, I, I am, I'm guilty. I'm guilty as charged. You know, I have a seven-year-old daughter. She is, love my life. Um, and there are many times when she is like, Daddy, let's go do this. Let's go do that. And, you know, after a long work week or after a long work day, even after I've gone out and done my own workout, right? I am somewhat drained, uh, but I've made it my duty, especially this year, um, as I just turned 41 last month on my Aries baby stand up, like, as always again, um, just to make sure that we really don't squander time. And as long as we have the ability to move and groove and move our feet and get up and do whatever we wanna do to make sure that we use that time wisely, uh, just to keep moving. Uh, my daughter is now getting involved with so many things from running to dance, possibly karate at some point in time. So whenever she's like, Daddy, let's go do, I have to jump at it. I have to go out there and, and do and move. And as long as I have the ability to move, I'm going to do so. And I hope you guys do that too. I hope you recognize the the blessing and the ability to to walk and to to be able to get out there and do a run or even do a home workout because those things are things that a lot of people don't have a chance to do when they get hurt, when they get older, when chronic illnesses start to build up and we just start to think about the thing that we should have done, right? The whole point of this show has always been to focus on what we can do now. And uh, I want to make sure that I continue to do that myself and to keep playing no matter how tired I am, no matter how busy the day gets, put the phone down, put social media away for a little bit and just to go out there and enjoy nature and life for what it is. And my guest on today's show is the embodiment of that. He's a Good friend of mine, great friend of mine, former colleague of mine. Uh, we've done Tough Mudders together. We've done a number of things together. And he is uh, the man with the master plan for this week, Dr. Joseph Riccio. Now, he is many, many things to many, many people. But uh, on this show, I'm going to talk to you about what his bio says. And Joe has always had an affinity for fitness throughout his entire life. He started personal training in college. And from there, his passion grew. At the Benjamin Physical Therapy School, he took a step back from training to focus on his career. But after feeling very overwhelmed and burnt out uh, for the first few years of his postgraduate school life, he started to reflect on his chosen path. Now, despite his love for fitness and helping others to see the joy of an active lifestyle and what it could bring, he started thinking about his career and second guessing his choices. He saw that a lot of his physical therapists around him were in the same situation. And after a year or so of looking inward, he decided that it wasn't the profession causing his feeling, but the healthcare wellness system as a whole. This money-driven, volume-driven system was at fault, he said. And he emerged with much more purpose uh, and too much more well-deserved refined goals. To reach these people, right, and fitness goals, and, and to show that health can become something that uh, for people who have chronic illnesses and, and issues, something that they can, they can really work through, and to do everything he could to learn more about improving organizational culture within the healthcare system for future medical professionals. From the former idea emerged very recently, what is now Empower Fitness for All, currently an Instagram and Facebook platform only. But each day he posts about basic tips about fitness and topics to make them more digestible for people who want to get involved in fitness, as well as videos with simple home exercises that can be done quickly and from home. Now, shortly, he will be releasing an ebook through this platform for people who are too busy, overwhelmed, or simply fearful of joining a gym or becoming a fitness program or beginning a fitness program. He is determined to figure out where change can be made to help people. 
people who choose healthcare to make an impact on people's lives and enjoy their jobs and not feel burnt out. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, pets included, please welcome to the stage my friend, my boy, one of the smartest guys that I know, folks, and the guest for episode 93 for this week, Dr. Joe Riv. Dr. Joe, what is going on? Hey, Dr. Sean, and I guess everybody listening. Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, yeah, I mean, that really does sum it up. I mean, I think that goes through exactly what I stand for. And I'm hoping that I could bring some insight to the audience and just give them a little bit about what I'm about. Listen, Joe, I appreciate you so much. You know, we we were colleagues together. We went to the same school. Um, uh, we've been through a number of conversations online and offline about life and PT and all kinds of things. Um, I appreciate you and I appreciate your work ethic. Um, and I had to have you on the show for episode 93 because I just, I like what you're doing. I like seeing your platform on instant media and, and Facebook and, and what you're doing out there just to continue to inspire others to be great. And one of the things I wanted to ask you first on the show, as you mentioned in your bio, that your goal is really to reach more people, right? Through fitness and health and to help those who have chronic issues to become uh, uh, less victims of the healthcare system. You right now are many things. You're a doctor of physical therapy. You're a certified training conditioning specialist. You're also a certified orthopedic specialist. So you have a, a vast array of knowledge that you uh, put on platforms that you share with your clients every single week. What are some basic tips that you continue to share and have shared with uh, people who either want to create their own effective strength program or conditioning program or just to even know where to start when it comes to trying to battle some of these chronic issues? Yeah, I mean, this is something I see every day at work, unfortunately. And like you said, you know, you're in the situation too. We see people with tons of chronic health issues, you know, coming into the office. And, you know, it, it sometimes makes it hard to find that window in because they haven't had much experience with exercise. And, you know, to address issues that have been going on for 10, 15 years it is tough when there's not really a good way to enter. Um, so for me with Empower Fitness, you know, I'm trying to reach some of these people before it gets to that point. You know, why are we waiting until we're in our mid 40s and 50s and 60s to have our first experience with exercise, um, especially with social media and all these platforms around? Um, so I think for me, it's, it's just showing people that things can be done from home. They can be done at the gym. It doesn't have to be crazy complicated. Um, so I guess number one tip for me is, is make it a habit first. <clears throat> You know, I see far too many people that jump into crazy exercise programs that are either super long or super intense, um, and, it, and it's just too hard. And it starts out too hard, and either within a few weeks, they're burnt out and they're exhausted because they weren't ready for that, or they're in my office because they have an ankle sprain or their knee started to hurt. Um, so I think the first thing is just is make it a habit. You know, start with small things that are doable each day. So if it's five minutes then make it five minutes. If that's where you need to enter, that's where you need to enter, you know, and do that every day. And, you know, after a week or two of every day doing that, you're going to think, oh, I, you know what, I could probably do this for 10 minutes and, and then start doing it for 10 minutes. You know, I, I think, you know, not jumping in too quick and too hard is, is the most important thing because you're trying to make this a part of your life. You're not trying to hit this quick, you know, lose 30 pounds in two weeks. You know, those, those goals are, are what set us up for you know, injury and, you know, overseeing that immediate gratification and working towards long-term goals, you know, are kind of what keep us healthy over the course of our lives. So I think for me, number one would just be make it a habit. Um, I think number two would be to find forms of fitness that you enjoy. So I think it, it kind of pivots right off of make it a habit. But if you are, you know, I'm definitely strength and conditioning heavy, you know, I, I do enjoy weights and I, you know, I enjoy, enjoy those types of things, but if yoga is your style of fitness or running is your style of fitness, you know, not to say neglect everything else, but maybe make those the crux of your program and then build other things in around it, right? Because if you're spending more time doing what you enjoy, again, you're more likely to make it a habit. You're more likely to make it consistent. Um, so that'd be tip number two. I think that would be just find things that you love and stick with those things. Um, number three for me would be you know, make sure you're properly prepared. You know, you don't need to spend the entire workout doing a warm up. 
But I mean, if you're going to do some squats, you might want to warm up your ankles a little bit. You might want to warm up your knees a little bit. And again, it doesn't have to be 25 minutes. It could be five minutes, but the five minutes you spend warming up for the workout, make that workout feel that much more doable. Um, you know, and then you can kind of hit the ground running as opposed to kind of feeling not the best when you first get started and then it takes 20 minutes before you start feeling good. Yeah, those are all great points. I agree with all those things. And I think a lot of people get lost in, you know, social media is so overwhelming nowadays. You know, if you're on Instagram, clearly with the reels, I mean, everyone, depending on what your, your categories are, right, for analytics, whatever your, your, your streams are, you can get just, just flooded with so many videos of people doing so many things. And the beauty and the curse thing about Instagram is that, you know, anyone can post on there, which is great. Anyone, anyone can post on there, whether you're a doctor like us or personal trainers, just fitness enthusiasts, whoever it is, can just put whatever they want to put out there. And it's great. But I think the downside to that also is that there's just so much. It's, it's sometimes hard to wean through, well, what's accurate? What's, what's best for me? What's not going to hurt me? What exercise thing can I do for, for where I am? And I think a lot of people, like you said, they kind of get caught in doing too much or trying to keep up with somebody else's program or whatever else. When in actuality, they should be doing things that are more in their comfort zone or more in the realm of what they like to do because they're going to continue to do things more if they actually like to do it. So I agree with you on those things. And I think that um, looking at your, your platform for Empower Fitness for All has been really inspiring, just re recognizing that you're implementing so many facets of what you've learned um, as uh, PT, as certified um, conditioning specialist, as um, certified orthopedic specialist, like all these things you're putting into your, your post, um, showing simple exercises for people to do with, without weights, et cetera, and literally just showcasing how many times to do it, um, how long to do it for. It's, it's just been really very educational even as a therapist, me looking at it, and I know if I'm appreciating it, then those who may not be in that same realm of thought also are appreciating it as well. So talk to us a little bit about this platform that you have and what sparked this creation for you to try to do it and why it's so important to you. Yeah, um, definitely. So I think, uh, you know, part of what sparked it was obviously like we talked about, you know, seeing people that are, you know, so far down the line of, of chronic illness that it makes you know, going backwards and, and getting themselves into a healthier place a lot harder, you know, so, so giving them access to this sort of stuff earlier, you know, before they reach that point, you know, making it less fearful to, to become physically active um, and to show them that, you know, if you don't want to be in a gym, it can be done at home. Um, but I think the other thing was, like you said, being on social media, I, I see all this stuff all the time. And I think I was watching you know, a program that someone had put out there and, and listen, I'm sure the intentions were right behind the program, but the person, there was tons of tuck jumps. Um, and for those that don't know, that's, you know, jumping up fairly high and, you know, getting those knees in close to the chest. And then, you know, that's a pretty big landing and, you know, the amount of repetitions just of, of all these different types of jumping things was so high. And, you know, this person was obviously very fit and again, probably with the best intentions, but, you know, to me looking at that, you know, there was no indication that that wasn't for a beginner. And to me, if you're a beginner and you see that, you know, you might want to look like that person, you know, you kind of jump right into that program and, you know, a couple of days of that, like I said, and you're, and you're probably injured, right? You know, maybe not every time, but in a good amount of those times, if you're jumping like that all the time, not ready for it, you know, no base of strength, you know, you're probably going to get hurt. Um, so that was really a big moment for me where I was like, you know what, I can provide things where I'm a little more honest in, I think what the level of capacity is, you know, I try to, as much as I can write on my posts, you know, advanced core work or beginner core work. So people that are finding it can, you know, sort of dive in and understand like where, where they can enter, you know, you're not going to obviously hopefully enter on the advanced core work if you're a beginner, you know, and, and I'm definitely open to opinion. So if you happen to find my page and you happen to do a beginner core work exercise and you say, Hey, this is not for beginners. I will gladly pull it down and, you know, I will change it to intermediate core program. You know, I want the opinions of people that are doing my workouts because my goal is to make it a safe platform for people to find exercise at their level and go, and go from there. Um, you know, and then I try to post educational content, you know, just terms and phrases that you may hear, you know, superset or circuit training. Um, you know, they're not always the flashiest posts. They're not always the most exciting, but you know, if you hear those things and you're interested in learning what they are, you can always reach out to me. 
you know, I'm always glad to have conversation. Um, and I've said it before, you know, I have strong opinions on lots of different things and I'm not always right. Um, so if you disagree, you know, as long as we're having a civil conversation, I'm more than willing to, to kind of hash out both sides of an argument or a training program and, and talk about benefits and, and, you know, things that you don't like about it. Yeah, that, that's a big, that's a big statement. I think a lot of people get very frustrated and almost offended when, um, they disagree with us for certain things. And I think there's no issue or harm in disagreeing or even like talking through certain things when it comes to working out protocols, et cetera. I actually appreciate the fact that you're so open when it comes to those things, because that's how we learn, right? That's how we all grow together. And there's no harm, even as clinicians in the clinic, you know, when we see certain conditions or pathologies and we disagree on the treatment protocol or, you know, what's best for this patient or just having a conversation about how to treat this patient. You know, there are a thousand ways to do certain things and some are right, some are wrong, some are different, you know, but that's how we learn together, trying to see what's best for everyone. And I think a lot of people, if they're not confident in what they're doing, may get offended in those situations. But I appreciate the fact that you're saying, and I agree with that too, you know, the best way for us all to learn is to hash out certain things and we go together in those conversations. There shouldn't be conversations where it's competitive or even trying to stifle someone else's growth. It's really about us coming together for what's best for the people, best for the patient, best for the, the workout group, best for the team. And um, I think if more of us had that same mindset as clinicians and even as workout enthusiasts, we'd be able to just share more information together. So I, I appreciate your humility in that. I appreciate Yeah, that. I mean, absolutely. I mean, even like you said, as, as physical therapists, I mean, for those listening that are in the health and, and you know wellness world, I feel like there are so many things that I've learned you know, coming out of school, different programs, you know, whether it's Maitland or PRI or FRC or all these different programs that are out there. And, you know, you can take these courses, rock tape and, you know, soft tissue, Graston, you know, unfortunately, I feel like the problem with a lot of these camps is that they're so ground in their world that they don't, they're not open to other viewpoints. You know, it's either you're a McKenzie practitioner or you're wrong, or you're, uh, you know, an FRC practitioner or you're wrong. And I think, you know, a better way to utilize those platforms is to, you know, have your own principles, you know, your own set of values of this is how I treat, and then figure out where each of those courses kind of fits into your values, because I think they all have good points, and there's commonalities in all of them. But you know, to think that there's only one way is is just so silly to me. Yeah, I agree. And I think you and I are from the same school of thought in that aspect, because, you know, you've combined all your specialties, I think, I'm just guessing, but the way you've been talking to me in the last couple of years, and even looking at your site, you combine everything you've learned uh, to this point to kind of mold your clinician or your clinical skills, right? Your, your CSCS, the OCS stuff, the, the training stuff, the races you've done, you know, personally and what you've seen in the clinic, those all, for me at least, uh, in my realm of like dance and, and, and uh, Spartan races and, you know, marathon races, what have you. That's how I also bring those things to my, my clinic and my patients. I literally just put the experience that I've learned mixed with what I've actually done because you and I both work out. We both are into not just saying what to do, but actually doing this thing. And I do think it makes a difference when, because there are a number of clinicians and even healthcare providers who are, you know, what they do during the day is not what they do when the, the clock is off, right? But when it comes to fitness, whether you're showing someone how to do something or doing it yourself, you live this thing. Right. It's something that you live, it's something I live. And that's why I brought you on the show because I appreciate that this is not just a career for you. It's a lifestyle. It's something that you've dedicated your life to really doing and showcasing for others. And I think that when you do it that way, then everything you learn gets also put into how you treat people, how you um, ha have a certain uh, classification for how to get people from A to Z. And I'm, I'm also one to not really feel uh, boxed in by all of these titles and, 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 um, classification for how we should be treating as clinicians. I, I do think that people are people. People get hurt and, you know, applying uh, a Maitland uh, protocol or a McKenzie protocol or whatever else to a certain patient is great, but not everybody presents the same way. Not everybody has the same issues. Not everybody's going to fall textbook in terms of signs and symptoms. So you need a, a tool shed to kind of go through and pull things out to say, you know what, I'm going to apply some of this if that doesn't work, I'm going to apply some of this. And I think the best clinicians do that. They bring together all the things that they've learned to look at the patient holistically. And I think I've seen just personally 
more people get better from that perspective as opposed to, well, you're this, well, I just give you these, these this, this sheet of things because if you have that, that means this. No, 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 no. There's more to that. You know, we're, we're people. We're, the human body is so amazingly created that, you know, it just can't be a simple textbook thing. It has to be bigger than that for me. So I hear you. I hear yeah. You. I'm, I, I mean, you really, I feel like you hit the nail on the head. I mean, for me, it's, you know, people are so much more than just the sum of, of, you know, what their range of motion is or what their strength scores are. Um, you know, I was just talking to someone actually earlier today this morning about, you know, more active listening within an evaluation. You know, when I, when I eval a person, you know, from when I came out of school to now, it, it's changed dramatically. And, you know, there's a quote out there that I read somewhere about, you know, and the average MD is, well, not even necessarily MD, but just doctor. So physical therapists included, um, you know, are interrupting our patients within, I think it was like 18 seconds. And hopefully it's gotten longer since that quote, which is a bit old. But I mean, that's that's way too fast. I mean, you know, my my practice has changed very much. And, you know, I know sometimes we're rushed and we don't have all the time in the world. But, you know, I kind of ask that first question of, you know, what brings you in? And I sit back and I just listen. Um, and, you know, when they're done talking, I may have a question or two. And, you know, when I feel like I've gotten the whole story, I then go back and ask them, you know, I read back to them what they've told me and I ask them, do I really, you know, do I really understand this? You know, do I, do I get what you're here for? Because the amount of times I've heard no is incredible. Um, you know, there's times where I think that I know, you know, based on my evaluation, exactly what's going on or what the problem is. And then they'll turn around and they'll tell me, you know, my range of motion over my head hasn't been there in 10 years. So I could care less that that's not there. You know, my problem is that, you know, within the last three weeks, for whatever reason, my shoulder hurts when I garden. And that's what I really love. So, you know, instead of wasting my time on trying to get range of motion, that means nothing to them. And they haven't had for 10 years, I spend time trying to figure out how to get them to go back to gardening. Um, and it took me a long time to reflect and, and realize it's not my goals for them. It's their goals for them that get them better. Um, and like you said, I think it's, you know, I use my own experiences to kind of help guide me, but in the end, I let the patient guide the treatment. Yeah, that's a big point. And it brings me to my next question for you, which is, I know you mentioned your frustrations um, with the healthcare system in general. Um, and, you know, healthcare in the U.S. is very interesting. We, we've seen probably the worst aspects of it going through COVID-19. But even before that, there were a lot of issues in terms of reimbursements, in terms of volume, um, especially in our profession as physical therapists. And it's a never profession, right? We went to my daughter had her, she wears glasses now, so we have to get her, her eyes checked. And I literally sat in an office with probably 30 other people, um, probably for two hours. Our apartment was at one time, and we were seen two hours later because there was one person in there and one, one tech. And, you know, we as therapists get that because we know how it is. So I, I wasn't frustrated, but I can see how someone who was just a patient, not in the healthcare system, would be very, very frustrated and even I was frustrated too. My daughter was like, oh, daddy, what's going on? We've been here for two hours. Um, but this is healthcare in America, which is great sometimes, but also sometimes like, what? Like, what's happening? Like, how is this possible? So, you know, I mentioned in your bio that you had some frustrations that you were looking at and feeling still. You've worked various jobs uh, in various uh, settings, and you've seen enough, I think, since graduation to kind of see where some of the cultural issues are. What are some ways that you think we as physical therapists or even the healthcare system in general can help to shift this culture for the future of our profession. Cause I think we've done a lot to at least bring PT to the surface, which was not to the surface years ago, right? It was just chiropractic and anything else. But now I think people actually know what we do besides massage, right? We're not just massage therapists. We do a lot more than that, right? We're not just personal trainers. I can just sit there and just tell you what to do rep wise. We're a little you know, different than that. So, what do you think are some of the ways that we can continue to push the culture of our profession, given the constraints of the healthcare system today? Yeah, that's a, that's a loaded question. That's for sure. <laughs> um, you know, I, I certainly, again, this is where I definitely don't have all the answers and I'm, and I'm trying every day to learn more about, you know, the, almost the business end of it to understand like where those margins lie, you know, in the end, I understand that, that being in a healthcare business, um, you know, it's certainly business, right? So you need, there is some element of money that needs to keep the doors open, right? But to me, I feel like sometimes that line of, of money versus care gets 
gets too far apart. You know, the, the money side gets too large and the care side gets too low. Um, so to me, you know, I, I do want to learn more about the business end so I can understand like where I can close that gap a bit. Um, but at least from my own experience, I, I think it starts with, I think it starts with the employees actually. So I think that, you know, you hear like a customer first or a client first, um, sort of thing being preached all the time, but I actually think that we should sort of reorient. Um, and this is not to say that I don't care about my patients, but I think we should work from an employee first sort of mindset. Um, because I think that from that will come significantly better care. You know, I, I think what's going on to me is that, and again, this is definitely a reflection of, of reimbursement rates, but I think, you know, employees are having to see like very high volumes of, of patients um, and very little time to take care of their paperwork, you know, once they see those patients, which leads to them having to do tons of work at home, which leads to, you know, sacrifice time either with families or, or free time where maybe they want to pursue passion projects or things that they enjoy, charity work, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, and I think it needs to start with the employees. You know, I think we need to figure out if, you know, are those lines too big and, and do they really need to see that volume of people, you know, to keep the doors open or, or are we just making tons and tons of money? Because I think that, you know, employees are getting burnt out. It's, it's something I've seen since I graduated PT school. Um, and I think when they're burnt out, you, you could tell, you know, their attitude is different. You know, it, the patients can most likely feel it. Um, and I think they don't care from day to day if they stay in the job or if they find a new job because they're not happy in the job to begin with. And I think, you know, the hardest thing about entering a field where your job is to care and you enter the field because you care and you want to help people is when you feel like you can't efficiently do that. Um, and I know that's how I felt. I felt like I had tools and, and the passion to help people, but the time constraints just weren't there. Um, and it made me feel like I either wasn't hearing them or I wasn't doing the job to the best of my abilities, which was causing me to burn out extremely fast. Um, you know, so for me, you know, especially in, in a moving into a leadership role, hopefully soon again, um, I think it's more about making my employees feel like, you know, I'm there with them and I, and I understand what's going on. And, you know, I want their opinion on how we can make this better. You know, I'm, I'm really big on, you know, I feel like culture starts with the people on the front lines. You know, I've been that way maybe because I started from the very bottom in healthcare. Um, but I understand like how important my techs are to my success. I understand how important my front desk is to my success. And I, I don't understand why when someone goes and gets elevated to a new position, why they think they have the knowledge of every position in the office. You know, to me, it's if I'm a leader, you know, and I have front desk problems, I want the front desk to help me troubleshoot those problems. Like, why would I assume that I know more than the people who sit there and do that every day just because three days ago I was a physical therapist and now I'm a clinical director? You know, and it's the same thing with the techs, right? The techs are on the front lines every day helping the patients. They're the ones that see the biggest issues, right? So when you have your one to one meetings with them, why aren't we getting the solutions from them? Why do we always top down control the culture? Um, you know, and not only that, but I think when they give us their opinion on, on what can change, as long as we act and, and make those changes when we're able to, it, you know, it gives them buy-in, you know, they feel like they're actually part of the process. You know, they're not just being told what to do. It's like, Hey, I came up with that suggestion and, and look, here it is. And it's working. You know, I, I feel great about that. And, you know, they're more likely to give more suggestions. Um, you know, the other thing that I, I've been trying to do more is find out where I'm not good. You know, I'm not good at a lot of things. You know, I'm not, I'm certainly not a businessman. Um, but, you know, there are things that I do that I probably think are great and, and maybe they're not. So I've been trying to figure out ways that I could ask people that I work with or, or patients even, you know, what is one thing that I do that, you know, if I didn't do it, we'd be better off. Um, and I think it shows your colleagues and your staff that you're, you're open to criticism as well, right? It's not just you, you know, criticizing them or, or telling them how to do things. It's, it's showing them that, 
you know, you guys all care about each other and, and we're trying to make the process better. So if there's stuff that I can work on too, I, you know, I want to work on those things. It's not just one way, you know, it's, you should feel open to talk to me as your boss, you know, or your leader, hopefully, and make this better. You know, I think, you know, even like you, the term leader is, is just such a better phrase than, than boss or manager. You know, I think you're, you're looking to lead a team. You're not looking to boss them around. You're not really looking to manage them, right? It's, it should be an open collaboration between everyone. And I think, you know, outside of, you know, time constraints and, and patient volume, you know, that's something that can be worked on within the system. Absolutely. You know, I, I appreciate your words. I appreciate the sentiments you shared on because I agree with all of them. And, you know, as someone who's been in a leadership role, for a number of years, um, you know, I, I try to embody that with my staff as well. Um, I think sometimes it does get hard because uh, there are constraints um, just in terms of how offices are structured and businesses are structured in general. But I do think the best leaders are the ones who can see the bigger picture. Um, the ones who, like you said, can inspire others to remember what they're, why they're doing it right because all of us at some point in time decided to do this because we cared about somebody like you said and i think that that becomes a second priority for us as other things are pushed to the forefront of what should be priority and i think as long as we continue to like you said remember why we're doing this and we do care for people that's why we got into this thing in the first place from the front to the back, right? From the, the, the clerks or the receptionists all the way to the aides and the PTs and whoever else is in that, that, that facility, it really comes down to us all recognizing that we're here because we want to help. We want to make people feel better. Uh, and it takes everyone. Like I said, it takes a village to make this thing work. So um, I'm all about empowering people and I'm not sure why, why you, and, and that's why you chose the word empower fitness in your in your tag for your, your media post, but I do think that that is one of the main um, benefits of a strong anything, whether it's a PT office or a hospital setting or even the corporate world. Those things, when you empower your staff to remember why they're there, to, to feel like they're doing something for the bigger picture and that they feel invested in what they're doing, not just because they have to do it, not because they feel like they need to do it, because they're recognizing that it's crucial for how the entire system is going to be run and that they take pride in that. I think it changes everything. And, you know, I've never been one. I've, I've, I've had a number of mentors in my life, a number of people who I've looked at or looked towards for how they run certain things. And one of the things, I won't mention his name, but there was a person that I really looked up to um, who was the owner and the leader of this, of this group. And literally, you would have never known because the way he carried himself was just so profoundly humble that it made me more inspired to say, well, when I'm in that position, I want that same thing. Not the person going to be sitting here and saying, you do this, you do that, but literally someone who is encouraging everyone to do whatever they're doing. And that same person is going out there and doing anything, whatever is needed, right? Not taking any, um, any pride in what he was doing, not taking any issues, doing something that someone else probably could have done but recognizing that I'm here to make sure that we all grow together and whatever I can work on, I'll work on that. Whatever I need you to help with, I'll help you with that. Like there are no, there are no, yes, we all have titles and whatever else, but when it comes to working out and, and helping these people, it should be team effort. Just like you're on a team and you're on a basketball team, baseball team, whatever, you know, we have coaches and captains and whatever else, but everyone plays their role. Everyone does their job to get these things done. Um, and it's not even about those, those titles when it comes to, performing on the field. It's about performing on the field and performing well and everyone being empowered to do that. So I completely agree with you on all those things. Um, and I think that we share that same sentiment at, in the fact that when you have great leaders and people who feel empowered to do great things, then yeah, you can do anything. All the other things that healthcare uh, continues to, to, to kind of put on us as, as hindrances can sometimes be circumvented when you have staff who recognize the, the bigger picture. So I'm hoping that we can continue to change those things. Um, but I am curious for you, Dr. Joe Riv, um, there are a number of different platforms and a number of different um, models, I'll say, um, that people are doing now that are just 
aside from the traditional models of, of physical therapy and, and of healthcare, right? Your traditional models are, you know, you have clinicians and you have, you have, sometimes you have aides and you have someone in the front to help you out. And, you know, depending on where you are, like you said, based on the healthcare system and reimbursement rates, you may need a lot of volume to help uh, sustain what you're doing, right? Because reimbursement rates are not the greatest in certain areas, um, based on certain insurances, and we have to see more volume to make up for all that we're trying to do. But there are a number of other models that I've seen out there that people are doing nowadays and incorporate various uh, healthcare professionals, such as massage therapy, such as personal training, acupuncture, um, even chiropractic, into their systems to have a more uh, inclusive healthcare circle that is not so dependent upon volume. Uh, and they're doing this in various ways that I'm seeing successfully around New York City, around Brooklyn, and even around the country as well. In your opinion, um, is there a model that you like or is there a model that you've, you've researched or looked into uh, that you think may be better or even best for the future of our profession? And if so, why? Uh, yeah, so this is this is another thing for me that's that's changed a lot, um, especially even more recently, um, and definitely have some 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 name drops here if you don't mind on who kind of pushed me in the right direction. Um, but I I actually always thought that my future eventually, you know, not currently, but eventually down the line would be in starting some sort of cash based um, sort of like hybrid practice where I can. You know, maybe see a little less volume and you know i can use whatever skills that i deem necessary because it's it's cash right i'm not dealing with an insurance i don't have to prove you know every little thing of why i'm doing and every minute of what i'm doing um and that's and that's where i originally thought that i was going to head which again is not something i would be opposed to i i definitely still enjoy the hour with each of my patients um but more recently i've been thinking about um subscription models um, and providing a service, um, of different tiers via subscriptions. Um, I think we're in a very digital world and granted, this is not going to be the model for every single population, right? Not everybody is super tech savvy. Um, some people are certainly going to need a bigger hands-on component, um, than an exercise component. Um, so this is not going to be for everyone, but for me, the, you know, the populations that I enjoy, which are, you know, people that are into fitness, um, and who want to get back to fitness, um, particularly for me, post-operative uh, surgical patients. I love working with post-op patients. Um, I think this this group of people, you know, can benefit from a subscription model. I think that to me, a lot of times they get cut off from the standard model um, by insurance way before they're ready to return to a sport or to go back to what they need. Um, and they're kind of left to their own devices to either strength train themselves up or, you know, even beyond strength training, like how do I develop power and sports specific skill to get back to my sport? Um, and most people don't have that knowledge, you know, whether you think you might or, you know, and maybe you do, but I think more often I've seen that people don't really have that knowledge um, and they don't know how to program for themselves. They don't know how to build themselves from strength through power, you know, back to sport. Um, and do that in a way that allows them to succeed um, back to their previous level or even close um, and even bigger not get injured again. Um, so to me, I've actually been toying around and, and this will be something that hopefully within a year or so I can roll out, but it's definitely a lot of work on the side. Um, something for these post-operative patients uh, and again, more in a subscription base where I'm providing, you know, different types of programming um, for this back end of care for the patients I like to see. Um, so yeah, of course in the clinic, you know, I'll be doing the front, the front end of the care, which is the, you know, the manual stuff, the, you know, getting them from those first stages of, of post-op, um, but then offering a service where, you know, they can sign up and, you know, receive like planned programming that's customized to them, um, based on their needs so that they can actually get back to their sport safely, um, and not have to do it on their own and not be, you know, clueless as to what's safe and what's not safe. Um, you know, and something along the lines of like check-in calls monthly or, you know, every other week, you know, where it's not a constant, you have to be there at physical therapy, right? You're independent you're athletic. You're, you're looking to go back to your sport. Um, and I'm just kind of guiding you there with check-ins to make sure that it's going appropriately. And, you know, I haven't really fleshed out this whole model yet. And, you know, obviously different tiers of service, you know, if you live 
in my area, we can always figure out a plan if you do want some in-person stuff still. Um, but you know, that's kind of the direction I'm, I think I'm headed. Um, and I would have to say that, you know, there's a lot of influential people out on Instagram that I think not necessarily the specific model, but are pushing healthcare in the right direction. Um, for me, the level up initiative, if anyone's ever heard of this, you know, they're very big into, you know, taking the healthcare system and, and almost turning it on its head. I mean, really focusing on the humanity, um, you know, behind the patients, behind the clinicians and making this more of a, you know, experience where we're not over medicalizing conditions and we're not putting fear into people that we're actually, you know, kind of helping them and, and clinicians and growing all together. Um, so they've, they've been a great influence on me. Um, and then more recently, you know, I've been looking at, um, the honey badger project, which is actually a group of two PTs, uh, head by a group of two PTs that I met. Um, and they're about helping people to develop, um, business outside of the standard medical model. Um, and I think this group is also another group that people that are interested in this kind of thing should look into because, you know, they show lots of content that is valuable. And I think learning how you can thrive outside of the traditional model. Listen, I, I love the outward thinking out of the box. Um, you know, I've mentioned a number of times on my show that I too am looking to do something similar. Um, that's going to be a little different um, for Be More Today PT. And kind of like you, Empower Fitness for All is is online. I mean, I've, I've done some things in terms of, um, you know, group and community work for the last couple of years, and I've enjoyed that thoroughly. Um, and I'm not ready to announce anything in terms of this platform yet. But at some point in time, I think we're on the same trajectory in terms of where we're looking to just change this game up a little bit. And I think that uh, the more that we all try to do that, just to help people in, in other ways. Because like you said, for those who get cut off with the traditional system, for those who really don't have a chance to benefit from all of the other care that can happen, you know, once they leave the clinic, because we've you've seen it, I know I've seen it as well, when people leave us and they're, they think they're good and they are good to an extent, but you know, not good enough based on what the insurance companies do say, you know, the chances for re-injury are always a little higher because they stop doing what they were doing with you that tutelage is no longer there. The comfort zone continues to, to grow. And the regimen that you were doing while either seeing you or me or someone else tends to fade because there's no plan after that. You know, you can return to sport, which is fantastic. But most people, including myself, even my own injuries, usually get hurt more when you stop doing what you were doing to get there. So having that in place, I think, would not just empower fitness for all, like you've been saying, but just continue to help people who may be candidates for chronic issues down the line to not have to experience that because now they have something that they're doing as a, a part of their life that is now something that's not just working out, but it's just who they are, what they're doing. And that can just reduce so many other injuries and ailments from happening. Um, but again, it, it does take more education. It does take more organization. It does take more of a, of a, a regimen for us to get that thing done and to get people more options for Healthcare, especially once the insurance companies and our current healthcare system says that they are done. So I'm looking forward to whatever you're going to put out there, Dr. Joe Riv, and and for all those who you mentioned on the podcast as well, we'll check them out as well because it's great just to know again more knowledge, more power. So I appreciate you sharing those names. Yeah, I mean definitely, and I think there's you know there's something to be said about in investment too. You know, I know that you know things are expensive, and you know not always is there money readily available to invest in your health? Um, which is why I, I will always, always, no matter what I do, put out free content because I think that that will help me reach people that, that can't maybe make the same investment that other people can make. But I think for those that, that can invest in their health, I mean, I say this all the time, but I mean, people invest in so many things that are, um, you know, maybe immediately gratifying, but so much less, they have so much less worth in the long term. I mean, nice shoes are nice. You know, a nice phone is great. You know, going out three nights a week instead of two is great. Um, but if you can reroute some of that money and, and actually invest in your health and, and your lifestyle change um, towards a healthier lifestyle, I think, you know, 20 years in the future, you'll probably look back and be really happy 
with that investment. Um, whereas that phone will be gone and those shoes will probably be in the trash. Um, at least in my case, they certainly will be. Um, but you know, I think it's, it's just a good investment to make. And I know money is hard to part with sometimes, but, uh, you know, I think the, the number one thing I've always invested in it is my health. Um, you know, that's to me the most important thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Dr. Joe Rip, any final thoughts you want to share with our listeners regarding uh, the healthcare system, regarding Empower Fitness for All, uh, regarding physical therapy, personal training, any of those things? Uh, I think we've, we've went through so much of it. Um, but I just think, you know, try to try to stay passionate about what you enjoy. You know, remember it's, it's about the patients. Um, but I do think, you know, change to the healthcare system is going to take lots of us. Um, so I think if you are passionate and you do have ideas, you know, pursue those ideas as hard or as scary as they may be, because I don't think that the healthcare system is in a position to change itself anytime soon. So I think, you know, the more practitioners, you know, and people we have constantly fighting for change, you know, I think the better off the healthcare system will be in the future. And that may not be this year or next year, but hopefully, you know, down the line, um, you know, but other than that, I think we I think we went through a ton. Absolutely. Where can people follow you on social media or otherwise? Uh, right now they can follow me uh, pretty much mostly on Instagram is where, where I do most of my posting. Um, so it'd be at empower underscore fitness underscore for underscore all. Um, you know, that's the platform where I post most of my content. Um, like you said, soon I will be putting out an ebook, which is, um, pretty much a beginner ebook. I would say maybe beginner to intermediate by the end, um, over six weeks of programming. Um, and it will be mostly app based. So basically if you purchase the ebook, you know, you have access to the app that I'm using, which will kind of populate, you'll have the app, it'll populate your calendar. Um, there'll be videos of everything in there, warm ups, exercises, everything will populate into your calendar for six weeks. We can always have back and forth dialogue on the app. So you'll have access to me as well. Um, and I will be, once I have everything up and running, hopefully within the next month or so, I will be announcing uh, free access to the first day of the ebook. So I will have that in PDF form, um, not exactly the same form as the ebook itself, but you can have a free PDF to kind of see what the plan looks like, you know, how the days are formatted before you even make a purchase. That way, if, if that looks like it's something you're interested in, you can then, you know, kind of make a purchase. You know, and if it's not, then, you know, you don't have to, or we can even talk further about what maybe would interest you. That is very, very exciting. And we will definitely share that on our platforms wherever the information comes out. So awesome. Thank you, Dr. Joe Rip, for being on this episode. You've made episode 93 one for the books. I appreciate you so much. And uh, I look forward to seeing you. I know you're in Connecticut, right? But um, whenever, yeah, uh, yeah whenever uh, time allows, Maybe the next Tough Mudder or Spartan race, we'll get something up together and do something together. That'd be great. Yeah. I mean, you know, Tough Mudder at least once a year. So for sure we can meet up there, but, you know, back in Brooklyn once or twice a month, hopefully to see my family. So if you're ever around, I'm around. And uh, I definitely appreciate you having me on. No problem at all. And folks, don't forget, he said so many things today about the healthcare system, about taking this thing seriously, about recognizing that you too can find other ways and various ways to continue your plan of care whether you're someone who've had a injury and you've been to PT, the post-op, or you're someone who has a chronic issue and you're looking for some kind of regimen. Uh, there's so many people who are in the healthcare system, either on social media or otherwise, that you can just really tap into to learn from. And like he said, knowledge is power. We want to empower fitness for all to go out there and be the best versions of ourselves. So uh, follow him on social media. He has a lot of great content already on there and more things coming out with ebooks. So if you are looking to have some structure to your life, uh, definitely follow his page and be inspired and let's continue to empower fitness for all. Uh, as you guys heard from our quotes from today, we don't stop playing because we get old. We get old because we stop playing. Let's continue to play. Let's go out there and keep moving, keep grooving. This is a day that you can go out there and do whatever you can do. Whatever you can do is good, good enough for you. So Go out there and have no excuses. Appreciate the fact that you can still move and let's be more together for ourselves and for each other. As I always say, our site is open, be more today.com for my book, our podcast information, our swag store. Go out there and become part of the Be More Today family and subscribe to our pages if you want to. We appreciate you on YouTube, uh, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. 
And if you want to send me any questions or even Dr. Joe Rib, uh, send me an email at drshawn at bmortoday.com or send me a DM for any of our social media platforms as well. As I always say, folks, have a good day, have a good night, have a great life, and continue to take your steps of greatness to be the best version of you. We will see you next week.